which I didn't, but I knew she was, she told me she was cooking quail, and I wanted the recipe, so she gave it to me. She said uh, there was a very important guest by the name of J. Edgar Hoover that was coming in, and I should, I should go out and help her so I could get to meet him. If it was a film star, I probably would have gone, but I didn't know who he was. No, not at that time. Early the next morning, only a few hours before the assassination, Madeline received a phone call from Johnson, who was back in Fort Worth with Kennedy. Lyndon called me from the Texas Hotel, and he was still irate. I said, Lyndon, about last night, and he went to cursing. He, he used foul language all the time, and he said, those Kennedys, he repeated, they will never embarrass me again. That's no threat, that's a promise. And I'd like the entire world to know how I personally feel is the fact Lyndon Johnson knew about the assassination and was a part of it. Yes? Hey, Edgar Hoover on 2192. Are you familiar with this uh, proposed group that they're trying to put together on this study of your report? No, I haven't heard of that. I, I, I've seen the uh, reports on this on the Senate investigating committee that they've been talking about. I want to get by just uh, with your file and your report. It would be very, very bad to have a rash of investigations. Well, the only way we can stop them is probably uh, to appoint a high level one to evaluate your report. Yeah. And put somebody that's uh, pretty good on it from uh, that I could select and tell the House and Senate uh, not to go ahead with the investigation. Yeah. There's a photograph that I published in Texas in the morning and the White House uh, photographer told you can see that Lyndon lost a composure at the time. Uh, Bobby hits a post and he has something in his hand and Lyndon is real shocked and the uh, photographer said that Kennedy, uh, Robert Kennedy said to him, why did you have my brother killed? Our president was this as a gentleman and a human being, this man is not. Yeah. He's mean, bitter, a vicious animal in many ways. I think he's got this other side of him and his relationship with human beings, which make it very difficult unless you want to kiss his behind all the time. He's able to eat people up. I understand that, you know, he sends all kinds of reports over to you to, about me and about the Department of Justice. Not any that I've seen. Well, well, I just understand that, that uh, he's about to be planning and plotting things. But he hasn't he sent me any report on you or on the department, anytime. Well, I had understood that he had, that he had uh, sent reports over about me. No, no. The overthrow of the government by force and violence. No, no. Leading no. a coup. No, that's a... That's an error. He never has said that or indicated or given any, any uh, indication of it. As I say, we'll all get through. Okay. Yeah. I'll talk to you on day or two. Bye. Bye. He did have a back channel. He read them, I think, to make him feel a little more comfortable uh, with what he thought were his enemies have a little more information on his enemies. They would be hand carried to a male assistant and the president would read them in the presence of that man and hand them back to that man. Dallas was to become forever linked with the murder of the president. But the rich and powerful men who had met in secret the night before had everything to gain from his death. LBJ was fearful of a long prison sentence, J. Edgar Hoover of losing his job, and the oil men of losing millions of dollars. When the shots rang out on Elm Street the next day, those problems were solved. The shock of Kennedy's assassination and its brutality reverberated around the world, but not everyone was grieving. The mood in the Murchison family home was very joyous and happy for a whole week after, like champagne and caviar flew every day of the week. But I was the only one in that household at the time that uh, felt any grief for his assassination. 
after the president's murder, Hoover had absolute control of the cover-up. All the physical evidence relating to the crime was swiftly removed to Washington. I had a request, and I, I have it here, where Mr. Wade requested, uh, said I request that you turn all of the evidence obtained in the investigation of Lee Oswald's assassination of the president over to the FBI for mailing to Washington. We're turning all of our physical evidence over to the FBI. This was on the direct orders of the head of the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover. From the beginning, Oswald was promoted as the lone nut assassin. But in LBJ's home state, tongues were wagging. I met Lyndon on New Year's Eve at the Driscoll Hotel in Austin. And the people in Dallas, I mean, everyone was talking about Lyndon Johnson was the cause of the assassination, and it made my heart very heavy. I just couldn't believe that he could be a part of something so, so bad. So I confronted Lyndon. I said, Lyndon, you've got to tell me, were you part of the assassination? And of course, he had a high temper fit, uh, hit the wall, and and he was very irate and angry and he said no I was not but the oil pe or he called them he, the fat cats of Texas that I knew and the intelligence was the cause of the assassination I am sure Lyndon did not make the plans per se but he had the key people that he could call to actually do it if the head of the FBI and the head of the Secret Service and key lieutenants of those two figures are involved in covering up, plus the President of the United States and all his cronies. You don't need a massive conspiracy to get away with this. After the assassination, Cliff Carter, Johnson's aide, made repeated calls from the White House to the district attorney in Dallas, Henry Wade. He was instructed to look no further than Oswald for the guilty man. There was no conspiracy. A similar call was made to the Attorney General of Texas, Wagoner Carr. Then we have Lyndon Johnson himself calling the Chief of Homicide, Will Fritz, who's really doing the dirt work as far as interrogating Oswald and trying to get to the bottom of this case. He calls him and tells him, you have your man. You have your man. Let it go at that. Lyndon Johnson is trying to control what is going on with the investigation of the assassination of President Kennedy from Washington, D.C., with, with crucial figures in the case. The late Dr. Charles Crenshaw experienced the new president's controlling hand. He was in the operating theater at Parkland Hospital with his colleagues, working to save Oswald's life after Jack Ruby had shot him. He was urgently called to the phone in an adjoining office. I picked up the phone and it was there I heard this voice like thunder that stated, this is the president, Lyndon B. Johnson. And he asked, how is the accused assassin doing? I was so uh, startled. The thing that I could say was he's holding his own. He's lost a large amount of blood. He said, would you take a message to the chief operating surgeon? It was more of an order than a question. So I said, yes, sir. He said, there is a man in the room. I would like for him to take a deathbed confession. And all of a sudden, the phone uh, went off. Uh, I returned to the operating room. I tapped Dr. Shires on the shoulder. He looked at me like, what are you talking about? Everyone was working feverishly in the abdomen trying to correct the wounds there. I said, guess who I've been talking to? I said, the President of the United States called and wants that man over there to take a deathbed confession. And Shires looked at me like uh, I was crazy. And we both realized that there was no way Lee Harvey Oswald, had he survived, would have been able to give any testimony until two or three days after the procedure. But still in all, the president had called and I did relay the message. When Dr. Crenshaw published his story in 1992, he suffered an avalanche of criticism. It was argued that Johnson made no such call. Crenshaw's critics were proved wrong by a former chief switchboard operator at Parkland Hospital, Phyllis Bartlett. 